All right. Come, Holy Spirit. Let my words be your words. So we will. Uh, we'll begin here. You know, normally I go to the uh, the 10:30 mass, and when we do these sessions, we always go at four o'clock on Saturday evening now. And, and four o'clock on Saturday evening is about nap time for my kids. And, and as soon as we get in there in that peaceful, calm environment of the church, they just just pass out. And uh, Hannah was trying real hard last night to stay awake, and she was she was standing up, and then I wasn't watching because Father Tim was handing out money, and, uh, <laughs> and she just fell over. <laughs> she just fell over, and uh, Chris was like, "You're gonna have to pick her up." So she's she's gonna be five here pretty soon, and, and she's not very light. <laughs> and I was holding her the whole mass and my back was starting to hurt a little bit and right when mass was over she woke up and she looked around and everybody was leaving and she said, wow that mass was really fast. <laughs> it's like, uh, for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here we are at the beginning of the greatest story ever told. We're in the, the early world, the turquoise. The book of Genesis today is chapters 1 through 11. And I've heard it said before that the end of the story often depends on the beginning. And how true that is with our story here. And you know how in movies, you know, they have that opening scene that just kind of grabs your attention. And that's what we have here today. You know, in these first chapter, first 11 chapters of Genesis, we have the plot, we have the crisis, and we have a hint of the solution all today in this first, first part. So this is a very important part of the story here, Genesis chapters 1 through 11. Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we start in the beginning here. These first two chapters are creation accounts, and they're very different. They don't contradict each other, but they're very different. Chapter 1 is more of an orderly, objective, how God created the world, and chapter 2 is more of a subjective account, how we are sons and daughters of God and how we are created in His image. So we begin here in chapter 1. In the story of creation, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless wasteland, and darkness covered the abyss, while a mighty wind swept over the waters. So, we see that the earth, the earth here is a formless wasteland. So God's going to begin creating something out of nothing, here in Genesis chapter 1. And we get that order here in these seven days that he takes to create the world, in chapter 1. On day 1, he begins to, to fill this void. And what he's doing here, he's creating a dwelling place for his creation. In the first three days, he's going to create that dwelling place. He's going to, day one is day and night, you know. He's got to separate the day from the night. He's got to make some kind of, some kind of time. Which, which brings up the question, does anybody know what God did before creation? <laughs> Nothing. He didn't have any time. <laughs> so, on day one, he creates the day and the night. He creates time. On day two, he creates the sky and the sea. And then on day three, he creates the land and the vegetation. Day four, five, and six correlate with day one, two, and three. He starts to fill that space. So on day four, he creates the sun, the moon, and the stars, the masters of the day and the night from day one. On day five, he creates the birds and the fish, you know, the masters of the sky and the sea. And then on day six, he creates the beast. And not only does he create the beast, he creates man. So day six is a little bit different here. He creates the beast, and then he creates man, who's made in his image. And I have a question. I'm thinking, if we're created in the image and likeness of God, how come we didn't get our own day? You know? <laughs> you know? We are created in God's image and likeness, and we are created on the same day as the pigs. You know? What gives with that? And there's a reason for it. As you see, as we move a little bit further, on day seven, God rest. Because he was tired, right? <laughs> well, God doesn't get tired. God rested on the seventh day. And in Hebrew, the word seven means Sabbath. Or it means a covenant. He's creating a covenant relationship with his creation. And while we are created on the sixth day with the beast, and the number six correlates with beast, we're not created to stay in the sixth day. He created man to come into the seventh day, into the Sabbath, into his covenant relationship with him. And as we go through this story, you're going to see these different covenants. And today we're going to get to a couple of these covenants. But it's creating a covenant with man. And throughout this story, we have to decide, are we going to stay in the sixth day with the beast? 
Or are we going to come into the seventh day, into the Sabbath, into the covenant relationship with God? Are we going to put down the work of the world and start picking up God's work on that seventh day? And you'll see the people throughout the story are going to struggle with that. You know, a lot of us struggle of getting out of that sixth day. You know, we, we don't really see God as God. We have our own things to do, and we're worried about the things of the world. So we've got to struggle with that. We've got to come out of the sixth day and into the seventh day. Genesis chapter 2 is more of a subjective account. It's more how he, he talks about a more personal relationship of, of man and woman, how he creates man and woman in his image and likeness. He creates man and woman in his image and likeness. John Paul II said that, that God is a family. Not that he's like a family, but that God in and of himself is a family. The Trinity is like a family. And if you think about God the Father totally gives himself to God the Son. God the Son gives himself back to the Father. And the love between them is so real that it is another being. As we say in the Creed, the Holy Spirit, which proceeds from the Father and the Son. And there are many ways as man and woman that we can, we can image God. We are made to bring that invisible image of God and make that visible to the world. And, you know, one example is marriage. You know, think of the analogy. You know, a, woman, a man gives himself to his wife, the wife gives herself back to her husband, and the love between them is so real that it becomes another being. And as man and woman, we are, made, we are made to make that love of the Trinity visible to the world. That love is inside of us. So God creates Adam, and John Paul II called this original solitude for the first time when he says he created man and he was alone and it was not good. You know, he gave him all the animals, he tells Adam to name all the animals. You know, and the way I picture it is Adam starts off with these really fancy names. He's like, all right, uh, you're a hippopotamus, and uh, you're a rhinoceros. And about three hours later, he's getting pretty tired. He's like, I don't know, you're cow, you're ant, you know. He's running out of names. And he can't find a, fit, uh, a helper fit for him. You know, none of these really make sense as a partner for him. So God said, this is not good. So he puts man into a deep sleep and creates woman from a rib of the man. Not from her head, and not from his head, and not from his foot, but from a rib from his side. You know, to see the, the equality. And men and women are very different, equal, but different. You know, a lot of times in our culture, they think that equal means the same. And we kind of blur that line, the difference between men and women. They're very different. And as you'll see in God's creation, as creation goes along, it gets more complex. And you'll notice that the woman is created after the man. And a woman is definitely much more complex. You know, and, and just in her biology, she is more complex. That doesn't make them different. It doesn't make them better or worse, but we're different. And it is our differences that help us bring visible that love, that invisible love of God. So the man and woman, you know, God creates the woman and brings him to the man. And the man speaks perfect Hebrew, and he says, ooh, la, la. <laughs> perfect fluent Hebrew. That's not really Hebrew, but... Finally, you know, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, he finds a helper that's fit for him, and, and we're called into this very first covenant, the covenant of, he calls them the marriage, one holy couple. You know, he makes this covenant, and the sign of this covenant is the Sabbath. Remember the seventh day, seven means, seven means covenant. So he makes them, and he gives them instructions, he puts them in this beautiful garden. And in Genesis 2.15, God gives Adam some very specific instructions. He puts him in the garden and says, your job is to till it, and to keep it. And a lot of times in these stories, we lose things in the translation. And it's always helpful to know some of the, the Hebrew language. To till means to work the garden, but to keep it means something very different. It's the Hebrew word shamar. And it can be translated into to guard and protect. So God puts Adam in the midst of this beautiful garden with this beautiful bride, and he says, look, your job is to guard and protect. From what? You know, you know. at this point, everything is perfect. The love of God is inside of them. They have no desire to do wrong. You know, they, they desire only to love as God loves. Uh, John Paul II says they are naked without shame. It's in the scriptures. They're naked without shame, which means they have no desire to lust. They have no desire to use the other person. They only desire to love. Everything is perfect in this garden. So we set the stage. But of course, in every story, there must be a conflict, right? So what are they going to be guarding and protecting this garden from. And we find out in Genesis chapter 3, this is where the story thickens a little bit, the fall of man. And in my opinion, 
Genesis chapter 3 is one of the most important chapters in all of the scriptures. You know, we learn, so you can read this story over and over and learn something new from it every time you read this story. And, you know, I'm not very good at memorizing Bible verses and stuff, you know, Protestants just blow me away with, you know, you know, James, James chapter 2 says this, or Peter, whatever, you know, I don't, I don't know any of that stuff, but I'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody on Genesis chapter 3. And if you want to open your open Bible and see how they do here, you know, this is Genesis chapter 3. The serpent was the most cunning of all the animals the Lord God had made. And the serpent said to the woman, did God really say you mustn't eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden? And the woman replied, We may eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden. It is only from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that we must not eat or even touch, or we will die. The serpent replied, You certainly will not die. God knows the moment you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will become like him, knowing good from evil. And the woman saw the fruit pleasing to the eyes and desirable for gaining wisdom. So she took some of the fruit, and she ate it. She gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So I call this the game plan of the enemy. You know, the, you know in, in football, the coaches and the players, they talk about how much film they watch and of their upcoming opponent. You know, they're, they're preparing for this game, and they sit down and they watch all this film about their upcoming opponent. Why? Because the more they know about their opponent, the more likely they are to beat them. And this is the game film of the enemy, you know? The game film of the enemy, and the advantage of the film is that you can slow it down a little bit. You can see the play developing in slow motion. So we'll slow it down here and see what's going on. This is the strategy of the, of the serpent. The serpent is Satan. You know, before Genesis chapter 1, you know, there was a war that broke out in heaven. Satan, uh, you know, the, the greatest of all the angels, the angel of light, decided to rebel against God, and he took a third of the angels with him, and they were cast down to the earth. And ever since then, he has hated God, and you can bet that he, create, he hates God's creation, who's made in his image and likeness. So this serpent enters the picture. And he doesn't deny that God doesn't exist. They know God exists. But he puts a question in their head. He puts a question in their head that's going to be a, a pivotal question that we're all going to have to answer. Through the whole story, you're going to see how much they struggle with this question. He plants the seed. And he's saying, did God really say that you couldn't eat any of the fruit? You know, he's got that condescending tone like you he, you can't eat the fruit. You're in here. You're working the land. You know, what's in this for you? What are you going to get out of it? You know, you think he really is giving you everything you need to be happy? You know? And at first he fails. And the woman said, that's not what God said. God said we could eat any of the fruit, just not that fruit there in the middle. Can't eat it or touch it or we'll die. And then he flat out calls God a liar. He says, you will not die. God knows the moment you eat of that fruit, you're going to become like him. What's the implication? God doesn't want us to be like him. Remember, we're created in the image and likeness of God. But the serpent says that God doesn't want us to be like him. That God's holding something back. That if we want to be happy, we've got to reach out and grasp it for ourselves. Because God ain't going to give it to us. The question he's planning in our heads is, can you really trust God? Can you really trust God? You know, how often do you ask yourself that question? Do I trust God? Do I trust the Father? You know, that is the... The question he is planning in their head. And the woman, you know, and you see those, you know, if you're at the pancake breakfast, I talked about those three social di diseases of indi individualism, minimalism, and hedonism, and how they're all hidden in the story. He's trying to get us to ask, what's in it for me? He's trying to show us an easy path, you know. You don't have to be obedient to be happy. There's an easier, quicker path. Disobedience. Disobedience. Just take the fruit. Just decide for yourself what is good and evil. You can do whatever you want and call it good. It's not that hard. That's minimalism. And again, the woman sees the fruit, pleasing to the eyes and desirable. Remember the hedonism, that pleasure is the supreme good. You know, the what's in it for me, you know? So you see him plant these seeds, these seeds of doubt. And again, you lose something in the translation. And some of the, the, the words in Hebrew that you kind of have to think about when it says the serpent is the most subtle, the word subtle in Hebrew is arum, A-R-U-M, and can also be intimidated, or can also be translated to intimidate. And the word serpent does not translate into little gardener snake. You know, you know it's the, the Hebrew word nahash, which is large, venomous creature, leviathan, sea monster. This is a dangerous, intimidating foe. 
that comes into the garden, and he is intimidating him. You know, and I, I use this analogy. I came up with this analogy. It kind of works, you know. Uh, I, I imagine uh, you have a, a high school senior boy. He's kind of a scrawny, weak kid, and uh, he has a little sister who is a freshman. And they're getting ready to go to this high school party. But before they go to their party, their father sits them down and he has a talk with them. And he says, look, there could be a lot of bad things at this party. There could be drugs. There could be alcohol. I don't want you to do any of that stuff. It'll kill you. And then he looks at his son and he says, look, your sister's going to be at the party. I need you to look after her. I need you to guard her, protect her, take care of your little sister. So the, 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 the boy and the girl, they go to the party. And not, all, not long after they get there, this big, huge football player comes up to the girl and he starts flirting with her a little bit. He starts talking to her. Pretty soon he starts offering her some drugs. And the girl's like, oh, um, my, my, my dad said that would kill me. I can't take that. And, uh, and the football player just starts laughing. He's like, your dad said that would kill you. Your dad just doesn't want you to have any fun. He doesn't want you to be happy. Besides, everybody else here is doing it. And if you don't want to do it, there's a trash bin right over there. It's about your size. I think you'd fit in there real nice. And what is he doing here? He's telling her that this is the path to happiness. And not only if, he wants, if she wants to be happy does she need to take these drugs, but if she doesn't take them, she's going to suffer. You know, she's going, to be, she's going to be put in the trash can. My question at this point is, where's the older brother? Where's the older brother? Where's Adam when the serpent is intimidating Eve? You know, he must have been out frolicking in the garden, playing with the cheetahs, something. You know. No, read the story. It says, the woman took the fruit and she ate it and gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate the fruit. He did nothing. Not only did he not protect and defend his bride, he let his fear get in the way. He fell for the lie himself. The lie that says you can't trust God. That if you want to be happy, you got to reach out and grasp it for yourself. And I think to myself, what a coward. You know? Adam, such a coward. But then I realized that the story is not just about Adam and Eve. And if you want to read this story of salvation history, you need to understand something. That every character in the story is put there for a reason. To act as a mirror. To teach you something about yourself. I am Adam. And his cowardly blood runs through my veins. It is like a cancer that is fatal to my soul. And without a redeemer, without a savior, without the blood of one who is pure, I am doomed. I am doomed. Now that sin is entered into the world, God told them that they would die. You know, they didn't die on the spot physically, but the love of God inside of them did. The life of the Trinity is gone. They no longer desire to love as God loves. They now desire to use other people. That's why they covered themselves. They covered themselves. The first thing they did, they realized they were naked, and they covered themselves. And we need, we need help now. And God gives us hope right from the beginning of the story. In Genesis 3.15, it's called the Proto-Evangelicum. It's the first sign of good news that a Savior is coming. You see what he says to the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will strike at your head, and you will strike at his heel. First sign of good news, the seed of the woman. You see this little red line right here that goes across your Bible timeline? That is the seed of the woman. That is the treasure hunt that we're going to be going on the rest of the story. We are doomed without a Savior. Now we're looking for the Savior, and we know it's going to come from the seed of the woman. And this phrase, the woman, also becomes a very important phrase. It's where all Marian teaching can be derived from. You see, the first Eve brought sin into the world because she did not trust God. When asked the question, do you trust God? Eve said, no. But towards the end of the story, a new Eve will come along. The second woman in the history of the world, born without sin, created without sin, Mary. And just like the first Eve, she had a free will. She could choose to do good or to do evil. And when asked the question, do you trust God? Mary said, let it be done to me according to thy word. She said yes. Eve's no brought sin into the world. Mary's yes brings forth a Savior, a new Adam, a new Adam. And just like the first Adam, Jesus finds himself in a garden. And just like the first Adam, he is afraid 
in the agony of the garden. He cries out to the Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But he has the courage to finish the sentence, not as I will, as you will. And through Jesus' passion and crucifixion, he proclaims to the whole world, I do not want to suffer, but I am willing to suffer and die for my bride because I trust the Father that even if I die, he will raise me up again. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, aren't we? That's at the end of the story, just so you have good news and you don't get too depressed as we go through this story here. So back to the beginning, we got Adam and Eve. They have the fall. It's a different world now, like I said. They lost the life of the Trinity. You know, they have these, their will and their intellect are darkened. They have these impulses to do evil, to do bad things. And God comes down and the blame game starts. They all start blaming somebody. You know, who, does anybody remember, who does Eve blame? The serpent. The devil made me do it. Remember, each character meant to act as a mirror. Look at yourself. How often do we say the devil made me do it? It was my fault. And who does Adam blame? Eve. Wrong. <laughs> Adam blames God. Read the sentence. The woman whom you gave me, she made me do it. It's your fault, God. You put me here. You gave me these temptations. You gave me these desires. You gave me these hormones. You gave me this lot in life. You gave me this lack of talent, treasure, and ability. It's your fault. You put me here. We blame God. We blame God, just like Adam. You know? And there are repercussions for their actions. You know? God comes down, and, and I picture him. When I first read this, you know, I always pictured God as just... He's just mad, you know. He is mad. His kids disobeyed him, didn't do what he said. He told them that he would give them everything they needed. If they would just trust him, they would live forever, they would be happy, they wouldn't listen to him, and he must be mad. You know, because he starts laying out all these consequences. He said, you know, into the woman, if we read Genesis chapter 3, right after that, Genesis 3.15, where he talks to the serpent. He says to the woman, I will intensify the pains of your childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your urge shall be for your husband, and he shall be your master. To the man, he says, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree of which I have forbidden you to eat, cursed be the ground because of you, and toil shall you eat its yield all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall bring forth to you as you eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face shall you bring bread to eat until you return to the ground from which you were taken, for you are dirt, and to dirt you shall return. You know? Boy, he's mad. <laughs> you know? And I think of God as getting angry and being impatient because that's how I am as a father, you know? I always try to make God in my image, right? <laughs> when my kids do something they're not supposed to do, I struggle with patience. I get mad. When they get hurt, I get mad. I'm mad. <laughs> They fall off the chair. I'm like, I told you not to stand on the chair a hundred times. You didn't listen. They're screaming and blood flying and I'm yelling at them. I told you, I'm not paying for those stitches. <laughs> I get mad when they get sick, you know. They start coughing. I'm like, how many times did I tell you not to put your sister's toys in your mouth? You know. That's just my, my immediate reaction is I get angry. Is that what God's doing here? Is he throwing a tantrum down and saying, how am I going to deal with this? disobedience. I know when you have children, it's going to hurt. If you try to put food on the table, you're going to work the land and toil and heart it from beads of sweat when you put, put food on the table. What's God describing here? The family unit bringing forth children, putting bread on the table. Is this just God's wrath? God's anger coming forth? No. It is an act of mercy. God is giving Adam and Eve a remedial course on true love, on fruitful love, on suffering, on suffering. In a fallen world, loving as God loves is hard. It involves suffering, but there will be fruit. There will be fruit from that suffering, and we all must learn this lesson of suffering at some point. And I learned it the hard way, you know, the three scariest times of my life. My first child was born, and my second child was born, and my third child was born, you know? I'm not looking forward to, to late February, early March when my fourth child was born. 
And I, I just don't, I don't, you know, it's a scary time. And with my second child, Hannah, the situation was really scary because we had our first, Isabel, and I was getting ready to graduate from optometry school. I had a few months left when we were, we found out we were expecting, and we were excited. We had a lot of trouble conceiving Isabel, so we were excited we were able to, to have a second child, and, and uh, I didn't know how the world worked, you know? I've been in, in school my whole life. I'd either been on my mom's or dad's health insurance or school health insurance, and when we had Isabel, Kristen was teaching, so we had her teacher's insurance. They just, they just cover everything. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking, all right, I'm getting ready to graduate. I'm going to lose my student health insurance, so I'll go out now and buy some really nice health insurance, you know? So I start calling up insurance companies. I'm like, yeah, I'm getting ready to, to graduate. I'm going to be a doctor, you know? And uh, my wife's expecting our second child, you know, no need to congratulate me. But, uh, yeah, I need some, need some health insurance. And they're like, uh, what? Your wife is expecting? Oh, call me when the baby's, when the baby's born. Like, no, we need it now. No, oh, no, no, we're not picking up your wife if she's pregnant. <laughs> you can't do that. Uh, yeah, we can. <laughs> I didn't know that they couldn't do that. I wasn't an employee anywhere. I didn't even have a job yet. We just bought a house. It was kind of falling down. It was a foreclosure out there in Alveda. There was a hole in the roof. It was raining right in. It was uh, a fixer-upper, to say the least. I had no job. My wife was expecting a child. Our first child ended up being born by cesarean section, which is about a twelve to $15,000 surgery. And we don't have health insurance. I was a little scared. And uh, I remember one day we were we just moved here, and, and Father Ron was here, and he came over to, to bless our house. And and you know, thank goodness for Father Ron. You know, I, I was having a really bad day. I was trying to fix the roof. It was raining. I had a bucket catching the drips of water in my master bedroom. I just blew a fuse. And I was at the fuse box cursing up a storm when Father Ron came at the door. <laughs> Made a great first impression. <laughs> But he was, he was such a, a calming presence, and he, he said, you need to trust. You need to trust God. It's going to be okay. And uh, so I, I, I discovered I need to find a job where I'm an employee, because they can't deny you then. So I applied several times, and I finally got a job at UPS, uh, unloading semis from 3 a.m. to 9 a.m. for $8 an hour, $1 for every year of college that I attended. <laughs> and I unloaded these semis with a guy named Tiny. <laughs> You can imagine why they called him Tiny. He was anything but Tiny. He had three jobs. He worked at UPS, he was a bouncer, and he was a bartender, and he had a very violent temper. And if you ever received a broken package in the mail, it was probably Tiny. <laughs> and there were many days where I thought I would be the broken package. You know, but for four months, oftentimes my schedule was this. I'd get up at 2 a.m., I'd drive in to work, I'd unload semis as fast as I could from 3 a.m. to 9 a.m., I go over to the university, take a shower, go to my office in Finley for a half a day, drive an hour to Willard from some office, and there they, they let me work in for a half a day until about six, and I drive an hour back home, get home around seven, and go to bed for a couple hours and get up and do it again. And uh, I was tired, and I was cranky, and I wasn't handling it very well, and I think Kristen and Isabel suffered more than I did. And uh, it was a very difficult situation, but after about a couple months, my health insurance kicked in, and they covered everything from the very beginning of the pregnancy. This is about six weeks before Hannah was born. We finally got health insurance. And, you know, I, I breathed a sigh of relief. And then around Christmas time, I finally got to stop working at UPS. And I'm thinking, I made it. You know, I can sleep again. I have health insurance. I have peace of mind. And little did I know that Hannah would be the most colicky baby in the history of the world. <laughs> Every night from about 9 p.m., to 2 a.m., she screamed. For about four months, she screamed, and she screamed. And we used to take turns walking in circles, bouncing her, until the point where you couldn't take it anymore. We got, I gotta switch, you know, we switch. It's a two-person job, you know, she and Kristen would take her, and then I would take her. And I remember one morning, at about 2 a.m., I said one of those prayers that you say at 2 a.m. when you're mad, and you're frustrated, and you're angry. And you say to God, what did I do wrong, you know? What did I do wrong? I was trying to be open to life. I was trying to be a good cat. And this is how you punish him. This is how you reward him. And as usual, God answered my prayer. Not in a voice, but in the depths of my heart. And this is what God said to me that night. He said, your whole life, you've asked me for things. You've prayed to me for things. You know, when you were about eight years old, you loved hockey. All you ever wanted to do was play hockey. 
You've never even seen an ice rink before. And you prayed to me one day and you said, God, one day I want to play in a real hockey game on a real ice rink just once. And you went on to play in several years of recreational hockey in high school and four years of college hockey. You got to travel the country. Twice you scored the game when you go in overtime. You know what you did? All you ever did was complain. How come I didn't get to play for the varsity? How come I didn't make it to the NHL? It's not fair, you know? And when you were in junior high, you prayed to me one day. You said, my older brothers made it to the state championship track meet. One day I want to run the state championship track meet. And one day I want to actually stand on the podium just once. You, by the time you graduated from high school, you stood on every step of the podium, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. But you remember what your prayer to me was that day? How could you let me fail so miserably? And when you went off to college, you said, God, I, wanted, I don't know what I want to do with my life. I don't like school. I don't like any of my classes. And I want to find something that I actually enjoy, something that I can actually make a difference in. And now you're an eye doctor. You get to make a difference in people's lives every day. You get to look in the human eye, the greatest divine design in the history of the world. You can see the power of my wonders in that creation of how I created the human eye. You get to make a difference. You get to support your family and give your wife an opportunity to stay home with your kids and actually still have time to spend with your kids. And yet all you ever do is complain about the petty details of your job and your work. And when you were in college, you prayed to me once, twice, a hundred times and said, God, if you want me to be happy, you're going to have to give me the right girl, you know? I want to be married. I want to have a wife and children. And if you want me to be happy, I'm just, that's why I've got to have it. You're going to have to give it to me. And now you have a beautiful wife, more perfect for you than you could have ever imagined. And two beautiful little baby girls. And you stand here in the middle of the night, and you ask me, what did I do wrong? You say to me, I've done everything. I've laid down my life for my little girl so she could even be born. I've rocked her. I've walked with her. I've done everything to try to make her happy. I've loved her unconditionally. Why won't she stop crying? Why won't she stop crying? He said, your whole life, you've asked me for things. You've prayed to me for things. And your whole life, I've given them to you tenfold. I've given you everything you've asked for. And yet, you won't stop crying. <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> Welcome to my world. You know? Take the sacrifice that you made for your children. Take the suffering that you've endured for your children. Multiply it by infinity. Take it to the depths of eternity. And you'll still barely even have a glimpse of how much I suffered for you. And think, after all of that sacrifice, how much you still unconditionally love your children. Take that love, multiply it by infinity, take it to the depths of eternity, and you still barely even have a glimpse of how much I love you. It's a lesson on fruitful suffering. Yes, there will be suffering, but there will be fruit. And the suffering of this life is nothing compared to the glory of the kingdom that is to come. God is teaching us a lesson here. He's telling you, I'm not going to just tell you what it means to love as God loves. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. And God desires mercy, not sacrifice. But he uses sacrifice to create mercy. And what he did was merciful. What does he do? He kicks them out of the garden. Why? Because the tree of life is in the garden. And if they eat of that tree now, they will live in that state forever. It is mercy. God is perfectly merciful, but he's also perfectly just. He told them in the beginning, if you eat that fruit, you will die. You know, and if he just says, oh, okay, I take it back, then we can't trust him. He's perfectly just. When you break a covenant in this story, somebody must die. But God loves us so much that he'll do whatever it takes to get us to heaven. And you'll see in the end who dies for this covenant, for this broken covenant. You'll see who, who pays the real price. Who is merciful. You know, so Adam and Eve, they get kicked out of the garden. And they have a son by the name of Cain. And right from Eve's language, it's almost like she thinks that this is the, this is the one that's going to crush the head of the serpent. I'm like, uh, sorry to burst your bubble, Eve, but we got a long story ahead of us here. Um, so she has Cain. And then they have another son named Abel. And uh, Cain is a farmer and Abel is a shepherd. And they both bring an offering to the Lord. But the Lord favors Abel. He said, you know, he, you know, apparently Abel made a good offering, and Cain was just kind of going through the motions. 
And Cain's upset. He's very upset because God isn't proud of him. And God comes to Cain and says, what is your, you know, what's the matter? If you do not, if, if you do your best, will I not also accept you? You know, if we give everything we have, will not God accept us? You know, that's all he's asking for is our best. But Cain doesn't learn his lesson. He doesn't learn his lesson. He has a hard heart. So what does he do? He kills his brother. He kills his brother Abel. And then Ab and Eve, they have another son by the name of Seth. And so now we have two seed lines. We have the, the line of Cain and the line of Seth. And which one do you think the seed of the woman follows? Seth. So you have two lines. It's kind of like a good line and a bad line. And there's a, there's a very funny verse here that people were really confused about. And I still get confused about it. And by the way, remember, remember I told you last time that I'm not a theologian. And if I make a mistake, please correct me or you know, raise your hand. And, Give me a better explanation and, um, you know, help me out here. But when I read this, Genesis chapter 6, it says, When men began to multiply on earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of heaven saw how beautiful the daughters of man were, and so they took for them wives, as many of them as they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not remain in man forever, since he is but flesh. His days shall comprise 120 years. At that time, the Nephilim appeared on earth, as well as later, after the sons of heaven had intercourse with the daughters of man, who bore them sons. They were the heroes of old, the men of renown. And who are the sons of God and the daughters of man? And the translation that they, they say in this Bible study is that the, the sons of God it is the line of Seth, and the daughters of men is the line of Cain. And what's going on here? There's a problem that's going to keep reoccurring through this story again, too. Intermarriage. Intermarriage. You know, so the good line is mixing with the bad line. And usually when the good mixes with bad, they just go bad. You know, they get corrupted by the bad. They, their hearts are changed. And so what happens is the whole world just becomes evil. And God can't find any good in the world except through one man by the name of Noah. Noah comes from the line of Seth. And Noah is a righteous man. And God comes to Noah one day and says, I want you to build an ark. You know, and you picture Noah, he's probably like, um, what's an ark? You know? And uh, Noah's a far more simple man. And God gives him instructions on building this huge ark. You know, it's like a one and a half football field long. It takes him a hundred years to build this ark. He's just building and building. People's like, uh, Noah, what are you doing? You'll see. You know, he's just building this ark. And, you know, we can learn a lot from Noah. You'll see in the story that some people really trust God and some people don't. Noah is a portrait of trust. Why? Because he started building when the sun was shining. You know? How often do we build when the sun is shining? Or do we wait till the rain starts before we call out to God and ask Him, you know, what should we do? God listens, or Noah listens to God. He trusts God, and he builds this ark. And God sends the flood, and he wipes out the creation and... And you know, Noah brings his wife and his three sons and their wives onto the ark. And it's like a new baptism. You know, God is starting over. And you'll see some very similar language in this story of Noah as you do in, in Genesis chapter 1. The winds that blew over. You know, God is recreating here. He's starting over with, with Noah. And the seed line is going to pass on to Noah's son here by the name of Shem. You know, he has three sons. They leave the ark, and God makes a new covenant now with Noah and his family. This is the second covenant, one holy family. We went from one holy couple to one holy family. So what, now we have this, this holy family, and the sign of this covenant is the rainbow. There's the bow in the sky, and God says to his people, this is the sign of the covenant. And whenever you see this rainbow, remember that I shall never again destroy my creation by the waters of the flood. So remember, this is the, the new covenant that he's making as we see a rainbow, we can remember that even in our loved ones, they're not going to be destroyed. Not going to be destroyed. So we have these three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and they spread through the world. They start populating the world. And the line goes through Shem. And the word Shem actually means name. The word Shem means name. And it's kind of like the other two lines that get a little bit jealous. And the early world ends in Genesis chapter 11 here with the Tower of Babel incident. You know, and you think, you know, what is this all about? And the Tower of Babel, it's like these, these other two lines, they kind of get together, and it says in there, it says, we're going to make a name for ourselves, 
we're going to make a name for ourselves. You know, if we're not the, if we're not the favored child, we're just going to make a name for ourselves. We're going to build this tower up into the sky. And why, you know, think about it, they just had a flood. And now they're building this tower. They're like, you know what? We're going to make a name for ourselves. We don't need God's help. We can take care of ourselves. He tries to send us another flood. We're going to be ready. You know, we're going to make a name for ourselves. And it's a good setup when God comes down and he sees the malice in their heart. Again, they're not trusting. They're not trusting God. So what does he do? He confuses their language. It's called the Tower of Babel. You know, they start babbling. Confuses their language so they can't communicate with each other anymore. And they start spreading out to the rest of the world. And it's kind of interesting how the early world here ends with this Tower of Babel incident. And they say to themselves, I'm going to make a name for myself. Because next month, or next session, we're going to start into this covenant with Abraham. Abram. And God comes to Abram, and what does he say to him? He says, I will make your name great. I will make your name great. And there's a lot of parts in, in these, uh, these stories, the parts that you probably skipped over. You know, the ones that said, this person is the son of this person, and this person begot this person, and this person begot this person. You know, those are called tuladots, and they, they kind of like going through the family history. But we shouldn't skip over those, because God's trying to point us in a certain direction. He's kind of pointing us towards where we're trying to head. And all those are going to point us toward Abram. And that's where we're going to pick up the story in the next session. And the next session is a session that you do not want to miss, because the covenant with Abraham is like the blueprint for the, old, the whole Old Testament. It's like the blueprint for the rest of the story. So that's going to be the next session.